Let's start with a question. Would you consider yourself to be a caring person? I think that everyone cares about something. And if they don't now, they did once. It could be big issues, problems that feel bigger than you, like homelessness. It could be, could be COVID-19. It could be racism, misogyny. It could be the treatment of immigrants. The list goes on. And perhaps you care about all of these things and much more. Sometimes the caring can feel overwhelming, can feel too much. But I feel that people, everyone at some point, has experienced these waves of passion and fear and hope and pain and helplessness and solidarity and empathy. And empathy is, is the big one for me, empathy. Empathy is the ability to understand or share someone else's feeling. And empathy is, is at the center of this for me, empathy. But how do we deal with this feeling? Sometimes you might feel like you could burst with the caring. Sometimes you might feel like you can't sleep at night thinking about it. You're just one person at home with your phone, trying to hold down a job, trying to find a job, look after other people. You're just trying to live your life without screwing it up. How do you deal with this helplessness? Some of us, we donate to charity. Some of us, we talk about it on social media. We comment on the right things. We stand by the right, the right thoughts. We promote these ideas. Some of us push it down. And then some of us use cynicism or negative criticism. Cynicism is a powerful thing. It's this sort of a comfortable rejection of something that I'm pretty sure you felt strongly about it's just for a second. Cynicism. It's powerful in the face of empathy. And then some of us deal with it by becoming activists. Activist. 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 And if you say it enough, <laughs> activist starts to sound like a brand of paracetamol. Activist. A person who campaigns to bring about political or social change. Activist. And apparently, I am an activist. I am known to be an advocate for slow fashion. I'm against fast fashion. I'm an environmental activist, according to news outlets and my Instagram. But what does that mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? What does fast fashion mean? What does slow fashion mean? Well, I'll get back to that later. I didn't choose to be an activist. I didn't dream of becoming an activist. I'm an actor, I'm a sister, I'm a, an aunt, I'm a friend, I'm a colleague, I'm sometimes an anxious person, sometimes I'm a loudmouth, sometimes I have big opinions, sometimes I'm af afraid in the face of all these issues. Yes, I'm an actor and so I work in stage and theatre and screen. I do voiceover, I sing, I dance, I, I don't dance particularly well, but I can give it a shot. And yes, that gives me the opportunity to stand on an actual stage or platform. I get a platform, but does that make me an activist? <laughs> I don't think so. And being an actor might mean that I have a confidence or I'm able to get up here and talk about stuff, but does that mean I should? I don't know. In 2018, I was doing a whole host of productions, very lucky to do them, and in two of those productions, they were produced by a Dublin theatre company, Rough Magic. So here we are, just minding our own business, doing some acting. And these two shows happened in the summer of 2018 and then into the winter. And alongside these shows, I did a photo shoot with a friend of mine, a photographer, Pearl Phelan, uh, an amazing photographer. And we needed some photographs of me, as performers do for their work. And so we decided to take these photographs in my home, in my own clothes, and they were all of these, get ready for the glow up. There we are. Good lighting, nice clothes. We chose the best. So these photographs are taken when I, that day, and I was wearing all my own clothes, and we talked about the idea that I was only wearing vintage or secondhand or clothes I'd had for years because I had started months prior to reject fast fashion and started to wear 
slow fashion. So this is where I'm going to explain. If you don't know already know what fast fashion is, one thing you could do is go and watch The True Cost, which is a documentary talking about the effects of fast fashion. And what I learned was that wearing clothes that were from the high street or online that are usually quite cheap are causing untold damage to the environment. We wear them about three times and then we reject them on average. And at the same time, their workers, for the most part, are treated woefully badly. So there was a lot of incentive not to wear these clothes. And in fact, I'm wearing my almost good fellas style 1970s look because this is a secondhand suit and this is a vintage shirt. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of definition of slow fashion. So these photographs existed and we were doing these shows and then Conlet Teven, the PR person for Rough Magic, took these photographs and as an environmentally progressive minded person himself, he presented them to Deirdre McQuillan, the Irish Times fashion editor. And I guess what happened next was what you'd call a zeitgeist or the zeitgeist because Deirdre had started thinking about slow fashion too. And it became this, avoiding fast fashion. Deirdre McQuillan gets some tips from ethical style maven and actress Aving McCann. Well, I'd never been called an ethical style maven before and when I had to look up what the meaning of maven meant and it means an expert and I just did, this is the first I heard of this, but it was great to see lovely photographs of oneself in a national newspaper, kind of exciting, of course my ego was boosted, it was all fun. And then that summer, I started to get a lot of interest in this topic and in the shows we were making. So I did a whole host of different interviews, podcasts, radio interviews. I wrote articles about it. I talked about it and it was still a lot of fun. And then one day I was sitting across from my very good friend Emmett. We were having brunch as wannabe hipsters do in Dublin 7. And we were sitting across from each other in Slice, this great little cafe. And he had the Sunday Times. I knew there was going to be an interview in it that I had done that week. And this is how it appeared. Aiding McCann, I can cope without cut price clothes. Viking star and activist Aving McCann puts, wants to put fast fashion, homelessness and climate change to the sword. So <laughs> Emmett will testify that I had what could be described as a small panic attack. Uh, this, first of all, Viking star, my episodes hadn't come out yet. I, I wasn't sure I, if I even made the cut. I could be awful. This was a lot of pressure. But more viscerally, the word activist put me into a panic. Like activist. This was the first time I had ever been called an activist. I'd been called a style maven. I'd been called lots of things, trust me. But activist is not one of them. And I felt this incredible wave of embarrassment. Who was I to tell people how to live their lives? Was I a fake? Was I doing all of this for attention? Yes, probably, and technically we were. We were looking to, buy t to sell tickets for our shows, but, you know, nice pictures of me. I just felt like this. I felt shame. I felt ashamed that I had somehow this capacity all of a sudden to tell people what was good what was right, what they should be doing. Yes, I'd spent the last few years trying not to use single-use plastic. I never bought plastic bottles. I tried to avoid taking flights. I cut down on my meat intake, all the good things that, that help with climate activism. But I never talked about it, and now it was out there. And I just felt embarrassed. And I guess what had happened was imposter syndrome had started to set in on me. I felt like an imposter. Despite that feeling of discomfort and this sort of realization that I put myself on this platform, I continued and for the next few years I did more and more interviews and it was fun and I've even opened climate action art exhibitions. I have sat on panels with my climate action heroes. I have talked about this not as an expert but, but as somebody who cares. And then at the end of last year, 2019, after three years of working in some of the, wor the best jobs I'd ever dreamed of as an actor, uh, working really hard in dream roles with the most incredible artists and the best stages and screens, I was exhausted. 
I felt lucky, but I was exhausted. And then there were two bereavements in my life, one after the other. And on top of everything, I just, I just felt so tired. And I had to stop. And at the start of this year of 2020, it manifested in a spout of depression and anxiety. And I just did not have the energy to think about all of these things anymore. In fact, I forgot about them couldn't consider talking about the loss of biodiversity or how we need to stop using fossil fuels. I just didn't have the interest. And luckily, I started to recover very quickly, thankfully. And as I came out of that, I, it, it dawned on me that life had happened to me and life happens to everyone. And life is tiring, but these things are huge and you feel small in the face of them. And we are, we are tiny compared to these big issues. We feel like we can't do anything and we can't alone. We can do things and make change with other people. It's important to consider that. And all of my need to be liked and the shame I felt around this and the embarrassment. And at one point I was holding my drafts for my Instagram page, I would write a draft about the environment and my worries about it and then hold it there for three days because I was afraid I'd make someone uncomfortable or my face would be associated with that girl who just keeps going on and on and on about things. The truth is that's my problem. That's my shame. I, I, it's quite clear now that I watch Brené Brown's TED, TED Talks many times about shame and vulnerability. And I realized that all of the things that I was worried about was just what people thought of me. And issues like climate change are much bigger than that. One of the things that struck me when I was researching for this TED Talk was last year, Timo Goschel, and I apologize to Timo if I've pronounced his name incorrectly, he did some research as to why people are not, why more people are not climate activists. And one of the one of the things that came out of his research was that we are driven by peer effects. Seeing the right thing being done encourages others to do the same. Alongside education, of course. But that is exciting to me. That if I do something good, I might feel embarrassed about it. I might feel afraid that I might hurt someone's feelings or make someone uncomfortable. But at the same time, I may be inspiring somebody else to do the right thing. And then my hero, Mary Robinson, the former United Nations High Commissioner, for, High Commissioner for Human Rights, must get it right, and first female president of Ireland. She always says, do something that is your ownership of the climate issue. Meaning that it, must, it might be that you don't buy those plastic bottles, that you continue to do that as a project, that you perhaps you stop eating meat, or maybe you turn into something like this and you start buying only secondhand clothes or from sustainable brands. And I need to include this picture of me and Mary Robinson because it looks like we're having the crack together in Dublin. And uh, it looks like we're really good friends and we're not. She doesn't remember me. <laughs> but we continue on and we try our best to do what we can. That might mean having difficult conversations with that person you love about racism. That might be about talking about the fact that please can we turn our garden into a wildflower lawn and not care what people think about how it looks. Let things be. be. Make statements. Don't be afraid to look silly because we have to start making changes in our own lives before we can ask for greater change. So when someone comes to your doorstep asking for your vote, you can say, I've made this change. Are you going to make the infrastructure in which I can live a more sustainable life and that our planet has a future? So take it on board. I say, don't be afraid to speak about what you care about. Cynicism can only go so far. It's a powerful tool, but it's, it's weak in the face of many people who want to make change and who care. So let's end with this. I think this quote is amazing. And now that you don't have to be perfect, you can be good. Thanks.